at this, um, probably pretty safe to assume there will be one next week, probably have some questions like this. Why do, or does, Frodo and Bilbo invite 144 people to their birthday party? Okay, it's, yeah, it's because that's the number that their birthdays add up to. Bilbo turns 111, Frodo turns 33, Frodo comes into his inheritance, meaning he becomes legally Bilbo's heir um, at that date. Okay, it's kind of like our 21. Um, where does Frodo move to when he leaves the Shire? Crick Hollow, Buckleberry, okay, Crick Hollow, it's a part of Buckleberry, so if you said that, that's fine. Who accompanies Frodo on the journey there? Sam and Pippin. Sam and Pippin. Oh, nah, Mary's not with them. Okay, Mary shows up about a little over halfway there, meets him at the Brandywin Bridge. Um, they take two shortcuts. One on the way to Frodo's new home, and then they take another short shortcut later. Where is the first shortcut through? <coughs> it involves eating something. They go to the field. Farmer Maggot's mushroom field, okay? But they get caught. Frodo thinks back when he was a young lad, used to get caught and everything. Then they make another shortcut later on where they, what are they cutting through? To get to, they cut through the old forest to get to Bree. Okay, shouldn't the first shortcut, which doesn't work out all that well because they do get caught, kind of give you this idea? Maybe shortcuts aren't the best thing. And then when they take the short second shortcut, they get captured fairly early on. Who do they get captured by, or what do they get captured by? Old, old man Willow eats Mary Pippin. Okay. Who rescues them? Tom Bombadil. They leave Tom Bombadil's and they get captured again. By what? Barrow White. Barrow White. Tom Bombadil rescues them again. Okay. Who do they meet at the Prancing Pony Inn in Bree? Strider. Who else do they meet? The guy who runs the inn, Bartleman and Butterbur. Okay. Um, what happens at the end? Frodo gets a ring on his finger. Frodo puts the ring on his finger accidentally. It's not like he's saying, hey, look, guys, watch this trick, you know, and disappears. Okay. Um, they leave Bree, and they're out in the country for a while, and they make for a mountaintop. What is that mountaintop called? I'll give you part of it. Weathertop. Former uh, Amon Sol. It's a former defense, former fortification. Okay, what happens to Frodo there? Gets attacked by Black Riders. He gets personally attacked by the captain of the Black Riders, the captain of the Nine. Okay, how does Frodo make it to the fort of Bruin? Whose horse does he ride? Glorfindel's. Okay. This is why if you watch the film, man, you get that one wrong. Because they give Glorfindel's horse to Arwen. Okay. She's not even anywhere around at this point. Okay. So that would be a you know kind of a pretty good example of the kinds of things I would um, I would ask. I want to go back, however, I'm gonna pretty much skip the first chapter. The first chapter is called A Long Expected Party. <laughs> Tolkien does that because the first chapter of Hobbit, published 17 years before The Lord of the Rings, is called An Unexpected Party. Bilbo Baggins is sitting fat, dumb, and happy in his Hobbit hole, and he gets a knock on the door. Gandalf shows up, tells him, I need you for an adventure. He says, we don't like adventures here. Go away. Gandalf puts a mark on his door, and these dwarves start showing up the next day. Okay? This is a long-expected party. People have been talking about it for months. Okay? Frodo invites 144 people, as he calls it in his little speech, one gross, 
which we're told is a vulgar term. In other words, everybody invites, he invites essentially to fill out the number. So who does he really want there? And who are the mere fillers? Okay. What ultimately is the purpose of this party? Okay, after he gives a speech, he says, I'm leaving you now. I'm going away. I'm leaving now. Puts the ring on dead. I'll throw some fireworks. Okay, that's one of the reasons. But why invite all of these people? It goes back to a question that you need to have read. Probably the prologue, though the text of the actual novel tells us this too. What do hobbits do on their birthdays? They give presents. They give presents. Okay? So Bilbo's going to be giving away at least 144 presents on this particular day. What is included? The ring. He's giving the ring to Frodo. He thinks, his mind tells him, if I'm giving out 143 presents, one more, the ring, will be a little bit easier. Okay? So they have the party. He plays his little stunt. He gives his little speech. Gandalf does the fireworks. Gandalf follows, kind of, Bilbo back to his hobbit hole. And he sees Bilbo packing up. And has Bilbo left the ring behind? No, he hasn't. Why not? Because he says, it's mine. It's my precious. Okay. And Gandalf gets a little pushy at that point, but he never says, Bilbo, give me the ring. Okay. He says, it's been called that before, but not by you. Gollum called it that. Bilbo does finally leave the ring. Gandalf does not force him. He leaves it of his own free will. He takes it out. He goes to put it on the mantle. He drops it on the ground. Gandalf picks it up, puts it on the mantle. It's not the you know, scene in the movie where they flick the ring up in the air kind of a thing. All right? So he leaves the ring. Bilbo gets his cloak on and leaves. Gandalf sits there by the fire. Frodo comes in. Gandalf tells him, you, you know, Bilbo's left you some things. I think you'll find a ring there. Don't, you know, don't wear it too much. Frodo says, oh, he's left me that too. They start to talk about the ring, and Gandalf says, we should wait till morning. In other words, there are some things you don't talk about in the dead of night. Superstitious, maybe? So, the next morning, they start to talk about the ring. The next morning occurs in the chapter, The Shadow of the Past. In this volume, The Fellowship of the Ring, there are two all-important chapters. That is, these are two chapters where we get a ton of exposition, of all the background information we need in order to bring us up to speed to fully understand what's going on in the novel. This is the first it's the second chapter of what's called Book One, the first half of Fellowship of the Ring. The other chapter is the Council of Elrond. It's the second chapter of Book Two. Okay? The first chapter here is a long expected party. What happens? Bilbo leaves. The first chapter of the second half is many meetings. What happens? Frodo arrives. And we see Frodo and Bilbo reunited. Okay, so the shadow of the past is all about what? History of the ring. Everything that Gandalf, well, not quite everything, but almost everything that Gandalf knows about the ring. So, Gandalf goes off, and he comes back years later page 46 in this one. And Frodo says, Last night you began to tell me strange things about my ring. And then you stopped because you said such matters were best left until daylight. He says, can you tell me now? You say the ring is dangerous. Far more dangerous than I guess. In what way? Gandalf, in many ways. Right? It is far more powerful than I ever dared to think at first. So powerful. Now notice what he says here. This is only 
46 pages into the novel. The novel's 1,200 pages. It is so powerful that in the end, it would utterly overcome anyone of mortal race who possessed it. It would possess him. Okay? So, what does that mean? It's pretty straightforward. Any mortal who attempts to possess this ring ultimately will be possessed by it. Is Frodo mortal? Yes, he is. So, if Frodo possesses the ring long enough, what's going to happen? It will end up controlling him. What has Tolkien just done? Foreshadowing. Foreshadowing. He's given away the ending. Because when you get to the end, when you get to Frodo at Mount Doom, he doesn't do what he came to do. Why? The ring has possessed him. He is totally, at that point, in control of the ring. That is the ring's way of saying, you Sauron, I'm over here, when Frodo says, the ring is mine. That's a bell. You know, a bell goes off in the Tower of Baradur whenever somebody sells that, or says that. And Sauron turns and looks and is like, you're dead meat, okay? But where Frodo is at the point kind of worries Sauron a little bit. So, Gandalf then tells him about these rings that were made long ago. We're talking thousands of years, okay? He says elven rings were made, magic rings that you would call them, and they were of various kinds, some more potent, some less. The lesser rings were only essays in the craft, that is, trials, practice, okay? Before it was full grown, and to the elven smiths they were but trials, that is, or trifles. To the elven smiths, they were unimportant, okay? But, Gandalf says, to my mind, dangerous for mortals. Elves are mortal. Okay? That is, they're mortal in the sense they can be killed. You cut a head off an elf, let's say Elrond, he doesn't walk around and pick his head up and put it back on. Cut his head off, he's dead. Pierce him in the heart with an arrow or a spear or a sword, he will die. But... Absent that, he won't die of old age. He'll just keep on going. Okay? So, he says, the great rings, Frodo, the rings of power, they were perilous. So the, these other rings he's talking about, these aren't rings of power. But the great rings were. A mortal Frodo, he keeps one of the great rings, does not die, but he does not grow or obtain more life. Notice the distinction. Just because he keeps on living doesn't mean life gets eternally better, or eternally richer, eternally fuller. No, it just is the same, day after day after day after day, until at last every minute is a weariness. And he off, if he often uses the ring to make himself invisible, he fades. He becomes what Tolkien calls a wraith. He exists purely in the other world, so to speak, okay? Sooner or later, later if he is strong or well-meaning to begin with, but neither strength nor goodwill nor good purpose will last, sooner or later the dark power will devour him. If he uses one of the great rings and keeps it. How long have you known this? Frodo asks. And how much did Bilbo know? He says, Bilbo didn't know any more than what he told you. In other words, Gandalf is saying, I never told any of this to Bilbo. Okay? He didn't know it at the time. He had some suspicions. Okay? And, Bilbo, and Frodo says, you know, Bilbo warned me not to use it too much. Gandalf says, that's very wise. Bilbo described himself as being thin and stretched. The word, the phrase he used with Gandalf is he felt like too little butter spread over too much bread. He just keeps on going. What do the other hobbits call him? Well-preserved. Okay. So Frodo asks again, how long have you known all this? Gandalf, known? This is bottom of page 47. I have known much that only the wise know, Frodo. Okay. Gandalf, 
you know, a little bit of taking um, offense at Frodo's questioning here. Okay? Keep in mind, what is Gandalf? Wizard? Okay? How old is he? Yeah, he's thousands of years old. Okay? What is Frodo? Hobbit. Hobbit. How old is he? He was 33 at the beginning. Several years have gone by by this point. 17, I believe. So he's 50. Woo! 50 in Hobbit age. You know, like 40 or so for us. Which is why Bilbo living to 111 is pretty good. It's, you know, 85 or so. Okay? So you have this little midget asking this really, really, really old, smart, wise dude, how long have you known all this? It, it's kind of, you know, overstepping his bounds a bit. So when Gandalf says, known, I've known much that only the wise know, Frodo, he's kind of saying, who the hell do you think you are asking me how long I've known things? I've known things longer in one sense, you can say, then Middle Earth has existed. Okay? Jenna, let me just throw this out there. What is Gandalf? Is he just a wizard? The valid. Is he in just an Istari? That is what he is. That is his order. He is what is called singular a Maya. Plural would be Maiar, okay? Within Tolkien's cosmology, he's an angel, okay? Or a spirit, if you want. Sauron is the same thing. Saruman is the same thing. The Balrog that we will see in Moria is the same thing, okay? Um... Galadriel is not, she's an elf. Okay. Elrond is an elf, half elf, but he chooses the, to be full elf kind of side. So you have these kind of creatures. In, in Tolkien's cosmology, you have the Maya or the Maiar, and then above those, you have what are called the Valar. They are the chief gods of Middle Earth. Okay. And above them, and completely separate from them, You have Eru, it's a V, a U, it's an A, Eru Iluvatar, God, the one, okay? And he creates through them everything that exists. Only when he's doing the creating through them, they're not called the Valar, they're, that's, they're called Valar when they come down into the world. The world that we inhabit. Okay? When they're not down here, but they're in the presence of Eru Lugatar, there they are called the Ainur. Okay? So Eru Lugatar in the Silmarillion says, um, essentially says, sing me a song. And they're like, okay. And so each of the Ainur, who are all named, there's a whole bunch of them, and they're named, they each sing, and they each sing the particular part of the song that Eru put into their minds, except for one, a guy named Melkor. All he does is kind of like play the kazoo. <laughs> he introduces discord into the symphony, and he pisses Eru Luvatar off, so that, after, just a second, after the little bit of singing, Eru Luvatar stops him. He says, okay, again. They sing some more. Melkor introduces more discord. Iluvatar raises both his hands up to mean stop. They stop. He says, one more. <laughs> Third time to charm, kind of. They sing again. Melkor introduces more discord. And Iluvatar stands up because now he's really angry. And he says, now let me show you what you've sung. See, they thought they were just singing. They were creating. And he kind of pulls out the film projector and starts winding the film and shows them what they've sung. And they've sung... The whole history of the universe. Everything. Beginning to end. With one exception. Us. Their song doesn't control us humans. 
controls everybody else. Everybody else's destiny is determined okay, by that song, not us. We are totally separate, okay? Uh, it's a couple hands up first. So, uh, the power of daylight time, are the angels their destiny? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you think of the orders of the angels, you've got cherubim and seraphim, thrones, principalities, powers, archangels, down at the very lowest of the angelic orders, according to an early 5th century writer, are angels. Just your everyday, common, ordinary, variety, run-of-the-mill angel. All angel means is messenger. They're the ones you just, you, they're the, you know, the heavenly postmen. They, they just, you know, go to and fro delivering messages. The, the seraphim and cherubim are constantly in the presence of God. That's it. Okay? So in this kind of cosmology, there are some Ainur, after a Ru Iluvatar, shows them everything that they've sung. Some of them come down into what is called Ea, the world that is. The universe, okay? And within Ea, the world that is, there is Arda, Earth, all right? And some of them decide to come down into that. When they come down into that, they become Valar. We would call them gods. I mean, this would be like the chief of the gods is a guy named Manwe. He would be Zeus. Jupiter, Manwe is the king of the sky. Jupiter and Zeus both have the same name in them. Dius Pitar, it means the sky father. Okay, the king of the sky, so to speak. So you've got this whole rank, and you've got all these different kinds of beings here. You've got fertility gods and goddesses, and smith gods and goddesses, and gods of water, and gods of trees, and gods of stone, and all this kind of stuff, okay? So Gandalf is one of these. As, as I said, Sauron and Saruman, Radagast the Brown is one of these, okay? The other two wizards, who are never named, are these, okay? So, how long have you known all this? Gandalf's going, who the heck do you think you are? <laughs> known? I've known much. But if you mean it about this ring, well, I don't know. If by no, Frodo means certainty, Gandalf says there's a last test to take, or to make. But I had a guess. When did I first begin to guess? Hmm, let's see, when was that? Yeah, the year the White Council <coughs> drove the dark power from Mirkwood. When was that? When Bilbo found his ring. Okay, which is... Let's see, Bilbo turned 111. He began that uh, journey on his 50th birthday. So 61 years had gone by. And from Bilbo's 11th, 111th birthday, I think 17 years have gone by. So 72 years or so have passed. So Gandalf says, well, I don't know, about 70 plus years. So they keep talking. And... Gandalf says, and now I think Sauron knows about hobbits. And he says, page 49, it would be a grievous blow to the world if the dark power overcame the Shire, if all your kind, jolly, stupid, bulgers, hornblowers, boffins, brace girdles, and the rest, not to mention the ridiculous Bagginses, became enslaved. Frodo, why, 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 why should we be enslaved? What have we done to Sauron? He says, there is such a thing as malice and revenge. What is malice? It's just out and out mean spiritedness. In other words, there doesn't have to be a reason for doing something rotten other than the sheer act of doing something rotten. You know, when idiots, I'll call them idiots, I think that's fair, that's fair to say, when idiots torture animals, they're not doing it because they're trying to learn something about it. They're just doing it because they get their jollies that way. Okay? That's malice. And revenge. Frodo Sikin, what have I done to Sauron? What does he need revenge against me for? He has his ring. 
he didn't send it back. It's not like, you know, he knew, you know, if ever lost, return to, written on it. For what? I still don't understand what all this has to do with Bilbo and myself and our ring. So Gandalf says, give me the ring for a moment. Frodo pulls it out. Gandalf says, look at it closely. Any markings on it? Frodo doesn't see any. Nope. It's a nice shiny gold ring. And Gandalf says, well, look. He pitches it in Frodo's little fire. And Frodo shrieks and gets chill out. And yours is a little fire. It won't even heat it up. But he pulls the ring out of the fire with tongs and says to Frodo, put your hand out. And now, if you're smart, you're going to go, like hell, you know, because that's going to burn. Gandalf says, don't worry, it won't burn. He drops it in Frodo's hand. But now what does Frodo see? He sees this writing, which is given on page 50, that he can't read, but Gandalf can. Frodo, I cannot read the fiery letters. No, but I can. And this is what they say. In the language of Mordor, which we're going to hear in the Council of Elrond, but he translates it for Frodo. This is it in the common tongue. One ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all, and in the darkness, bind them. He says, two lines of a longer verse. The longer verse is about the rings of power. These two lines are about the one ring that rules all the rings of power. Guess what, Frodo? You've got the master ring. You've got the one ring. This is the one ring that he lost many ages ago to the great weakening of his power. He greatly desires it, but he must not get it. In other words, if you don't want Sauron to run rampant across all of the world, he cannot get this ring back. Frodo, but how, how on earth did it come to me? Which is kind of odd, because nowhere else really in the story do they refer to the place they inhabit, the world, as Earth. It's called Arda, usually, or Middle Earth. How on earth did it come to me? And Gandalf says, well, that, you know, that's a, that's a good story. Let me tell you. So he starts. He says, last night I told you about Sauron, Baradur, the Dark Tower. And then he talks about the history more fully of all the rings. He talks about the three elvish rings okay, that were hid from him. He talks about the seven dwarf king rings. So the three elvish rings, Sauron doesn't have. The dwarf king rings, he has three of those. The other four have been destroyed. He gave nine to mortal men. He has those back. Okay. So what else is there? The one. Frodo, page 52. Why wasn't it destroyed? Gandalf says he's been seeking it. Now he knows about the Shire and such. Why wasn't it destroyed? How did the enemy ever come to lose it if he was so strong? And if it was so precious to him? Gandalf says it was taken from him. Okay. Talks about the battle with Gil-galad and Elendil and Isildur. And Gil-galad and Elendil die. And Isildur cuts the ring from Sauron's finger. But he keeps it. He doesn't take it from, at that moment, right up to the top of Mount Doom and throw it in the fire as he should. All right? Gandalf says, Isildur fell in the river. The ring passed out of time. Until long ago, bottom of that page, there lived by the banks of the great river a clever-handed and quiet-footed little people. He says, they're hobbit-like people. Right? And he tells the story of Smeagol and Diagol. Okay? They're out fishing one day, and Diagol finds, bottom of the river, a golden ring. And Smeagol says, give us that, Diagol, my love. Why? Because it's my birthday, and I want it. I don't care. I already gave you a present. More than I could afford. Notice, by the way, the difference in custom. These receive presents on their birthdays rather than the Hobbit form of giving presents. OK? 
Okay? And so what does Smeagol do? He throttles him. He chokes him to death and steals the ring. So how does Smeagol come in possession of the ring? Murder. He doesn't do a good deed to get it. Okay? He doesn't begin his ownership nicely. He begins it through murder. What happens to Smeagol? He eventually is exiled. He's ostracized. Because what does he use the ring to do? He steals. He spies. Because he learns, the ring makes him invisible. So he listens to people's secrets and uses them against them. And Gandalf finishes his little, his little story and says eventually he made his way up into the highlands and then he went down into the roots of the mountains where Bilbo meets him how many years later? Yeah, Gollum's about 600 years old at the beginning of this book. How old is Bilbo? And they think he's well-preserved. 111. Okay. Gollum, Frodo says, page 54. Do you mean that this is the very same Gollum creature that Bilbo met? How loathsome. Gandalf says, I think it's a sad story. And it might have happened to others, even to some hobbits that I have known. In other words, Frodo, don't get so full of yourself. Don't think that this won't happen to you. I can't believe Gollum was connected with hobbits, however distantly. What an abominable notion. Why? Why is it so hard for him to believe Gollum was a hobbit or connected to hobbits? Because, okay. Why do we have to believe? Notice the way I put that. Why do we have to believe that people like Hitler were mentally ill? We don't want to believe that I could be capable of that. And to say that Hitler was in his sane, right mind and did what he did is a way of saying, and anybody could do that. So we say, no, no, no. He was crazy. He had syphilis. That's it. He had syphilis. His brain was rotted. That's it. All right? What else does that allow you to do? You see it in the history of warfare, especially in the 20th century. What, do you, what does one nation do to another nation when it gets at war with that nation? How? Okay. You dehumanize the others. So that when the United States went to war against Japan, after Japan attacked the United States at Pearl Harbor, were we fighting the Japanese? No. We were fighting... Not just the Japs, the Nips, okay? Vietnam, who, was, who were we fighting? The North Vietnamese? That's a mouthful. It's a lot easier to say, the Gooks, okay? Were we fighting the Germans? No, the Jerrys. So you take some kind of characteristic and you blow it out of proportion so that it makes it a whole lot easier to shoot somebody or kill somebody who's not like you. We're going to see this beautiful scene Tolkien puts in here where Sam, who's kind of, yeah, you know, we're the West, we're going to kill, you know, bad orcs, kill them all. And then he's going to see one of the enemy fall dead right in front of him. And he immediately starts to think, did this guy have a family? What was he told to make him be here at this moment in time? Was this for glory in the fatherland? Or was it for personal wealth? Or were they all lies? Okay. And I can't help but think that's Tolkien talking about his experience. So Gandalf goes on and talks about Gollum. He describes Gollum to him. Okay. Frodo says, page 55, when Gandalf says, he hated the dark, Gollum, he hated the dark, he hated light, he hated everything, the ring most of all. Frodo's like, whoa, time out. I don't understand. What do you mean? Wasn't it his precious? 
And the only thing he cared for, if he hated it, why didn't he get rid of it or go away? Again, it's like, come on, Frodo, stick with me. This isn't that hard. You ought to begin to understand he could not get rid of it. He had no will left in the matter. Why? Go back to the first thing Gandalf says about the ring. A ring of power possessed by a mortal will possess the mortal. How long has Gollum, did Gollum have it before Bilbo took it from him? Over 500 years. Okay? A ring of power looks after itself, Fredo. And this is where it gets really important. It may slip off treacherously, but its keeper never abandons it. And most he plays with the idea of handing it on to someone else's care. Okay? As far as I know, Bilbo is the only person who has ever really done it, that has given the ring up. It wasn't Gollum Frodo, but the ring itself that decided things. The ring left him. And Frodo's all facetious. Oh, you mean just in time so that Bilbo of the Shire could pick it up and find it? Wouldn't an orc have suited it better? It's no laughing matter. Not for you. There was more than one power at work, Frodo. The ring was trying to get back to its master. That's one power at work. Okay, so the ring left Gollum. While Gollum was slinking around in the tunnels. It had slipped from Isildur's hand and betrayed him when he was crossing or swimming in the river Anduin. It had caught poor Diagol. Gollum killed him. Okay. It could make no further use of Gollum. Why? Because Gollum never went anywhere. All he did was stay at the bottom of the mountains. The ring was never going get to back, get back home unless it left Gollum. So now when its master was awake and once more sending out his dark thought from Mirkwood, it abandoned the Gollum, only to be picked up by the most unlikely person imaginable, Bilbo from the Shire. See, when the ring slipped off Gollum's finger, Sauron wasn't hundreds of miles away down in Mordor. He was only scores of miles away. Okay? Because Mirkwood borders on the mountains that Frodo, that Bilbo, excuse me, got lost under. So Gandalf says, behind that there was something else at work beyond any design of the ringmaker. So we have the ring at work. We have Sauron sending out his dark thought. There's two powers at work. Now Gandalf says, there's a third power at work. Something beyond the design of Sauron. I can put it no plainer than by saying that Bilbo was meant to find the ring and not by its maker in which case you also were meant to have it. And that may be an encouraging thought. Okay? Meant. Okay? From the verb to mean, or to intend. Okay? But in order for something to mean, or in order to intend, what must be behind? What must be acting on the verb? What must be the agent of the verb? Somebody, something, there has to be a will or mind doing the meaning. I mean for this to happen. Okay? Gandalf never states who that is or what that is. He just says, there's another power at work. And that may be an encouraging thought. Put yourself in photo shoes. You have just told me I have essentially, our terms, Satan's ring and he wants it back. And he's sending out his little minions for it. And that's supposed to be encouraging? It's not. I, I'm not sure I understand you. Do you really know all this? Or are you just guessing? I knew much and I have learned much. But I'm not going to give an account of all my doings to you. The history of Elendil and Isildur and the one ring is known to all the wise. All the wise, your ring is shown to be that one ring because of the writing on it. Frodo, when did you discover that? It's like, smack. Just now, you stupid little hobbit. It's just now that I saw the ring heated up. Just now in this room. Then he says, and by talking to Gollum. What? Whoa, stop. You've seen Gollum? Yes, obvious thing to do, of course. Then, then what happened after Bill escaped from him? Do you know that? And he goes, mm, not so clearly. Not easy to get the truth out of him, but I... He says, you know, I put the fear of pain in him. 
and I'm going to skip a bunch. He talks about how he and a friend of his captured Gollum, and he questioned him, and how he's now safe with the Wood Elves, locked up, essentially. But he does tell Frodo, where did Gollum get to before Gandalf got to question him? He made his way all the way down to Mordor, where he met Sauron. Met, personally, you know, audience with Satan, so to speak. And Sauron let him go. And now, alas, page 59. He knows where Isildur fell. He knows where Gollum found his ring. He knows it is a great ring. He knows it's not one of the three, for they have never been lost, and they endure no evil. He knows it's not one of the seven, nor the nine, for they are accounted for. Therefore, a little simple logic, it is the one. And he has at last I heard, I think, of hobbits in the Shire. And he may be seeking for it now. He may even know the name of Baggins. Frodo, middle of 59, but this is terrible. Far worse than the worst that I imagine from your hints and warnings. O Gandalf, best of friends, what am I to do? For now I am really afraid. What am I to do? What's he really mean? What am I to do? Five words. It's really a two-word question. Why me? Why me? Okay, And he says, what a pity Bilbo did not stab that vile creature when he had a chance. What does he mean by pity? What a pity that Bilbo did not stab that vile creature when he had the chance. What a pity for who? For Frodo. Or you can replace the word maybe pity. What a shame. You know, Bilbo had the chance. He's right there. Gollum comes and jumps over him in the hobbit. All Bilbo has to do with that sword that he has is just, you know, and he can stick him on it. Be done with him. Gandalf. Pity? It was pity that stayed his hand. Pity and mercy. What's the difference? Between pity and mercy. What's pity? When you feel sorry for someone. Man, that really sucks to be in those shoes that you're wearing. Your life is really bad. You know, people in Houston or Beaumont, Texas, etc. People in Southern Florida who are looking at Irma, you know, you know, making a beeline for them. What a pity that is. Okay? It's a kind of, you know, empathy with them, right? Does it involve doing anything? Nope. <laughs> it's you get on the highway and there's that guy standing on the highway holding the sign, you know, homeless, anything else. Oh, man, that really sucks. See you later. <laughs> so it can be very short-lived, okay? So then what's mercy? Well, mercy is when someone is in your control or your power, or you have the power to change their situation. You can think of it in a judicial setting. A judge can practice mercy. You might be found guilty, and the judge can say, you've already served your time. That is, the very fact you've been found guilty, and you know you're guilty, no sense. Right? That would be mercy. The person is totally in the judge's hands. And the judge says, not going to do anything. Right? Or it could be something else. It could be you're getting ready to get on the highway. The light for you to go is red. And there's a guy standing right there with a sign. Anything else? You could roll down your window and give him five. What have you just done? In that particular moment in time, you've felt this. But you've shown this. And what does this do? <clears throat> it alleviates the situation that causes the pity. Because the guy might be hungry. You give him five bucks, five bucks buys a burger. He won't be hungry for a few hours. 
doesn't solve world hunger, solves it temporarily. It was pity that stayed his hand. Pity and mercy not to strike without need. Back in The Hobbit, Bilbo didn't need to strike Gollum. He could get away without harming him. He thinks about it. He thinks about killing him. Why? Because he intends to kill me. In other words, Bilbo thinks preemptive war. I better strike him before he strikes me. And he has been well rewarded, Frodo. Be sure that he took so little hurt from the evil. What's the evil? The ring. He took so little hurt from the evil and escaped in the end because he began his ownership of the ring so. With pity. He begins his ownership of the ring with thinking, man, I really feel for this guy. And he does. In The Hobbit, you read the Bilbo's thoughts, and he wonders how long this creature's been down here. They, they take part in a little game. The little game will determine whether or not Bilbo gets to leave or not. It's a game of riddles. And what's kind of interesting is they know the same riddles, which is a pretty good indicator. They come from the same stock of beings, if you want. Okay? Frodo, I'm sorry, but I am frightened, and I do not feel any pity for Gollum. Okay. Why doesn't he feel any pity? He just told us. Okay, he feels pity for himself. He's scared. He is scared. And because he's scared, all of those fight or flight responses are going on. And he's not thinking of what? Anybody else. He's thinking only of himself. Okay? I am frightened. Why? Sauron is after me. I don't feel any pity for Gollum. It's because of Gollum. Gandalf, you have not seen him. Why does he say that? You would if you saw him. Here you are. You're kind of pontificating and you don't know what you're talking about. If I were to put Gollum right here in front of you, you'd go, oh, poor boy or thing. You have not seen him. No, and I don't want to. Why? Exactly. He doesn't want to see Gollum because then he would feel pity. Notice, he doesn't want to feel pity. Notice. The emotion here isn't just, ooh, whatever happens, and I just roll with it. Frodo was saying, I have a choice as to how I react. I have a choice as to how I feel. And he's saying, and I don't want to choose to feel for Gollum. I would rather he burn in hell, essentially. I don't want to. I can't understand you. Do you mean to say you and the elves have let him live on after all those horrible deeds. What does he mean, let him live on? What is he presupposing lay in Gandalf's hands or in his power? Life and death. That it's Gandalf's decision whether or not Gollum lives or dies. Now, at any rate, that is, forget the past. Forget all of those years ago. Forget Diagol. Forget Bilbo. Now. He is as bad as an orc and just an enemy. He deserves death. Just an enemy. What does the just mean? It's all important. Yeah. Only. The only reason he exists is to be an enemy. Well, what do you do to enemies? You kill them. You remove them. You know, the word Satan, what does it mean? Adversary. Okay? You get rid of your adversary. You don't make nice with them. You don't go bring them flowers. You don't try to persuade them that you're actually good. You kill them. Okay? When he says he's as bad as an orc, what does he mean? Tolkien's world, Tolkien's creation, orcs have no redeeming qualities. None. They are truly deplorables and irredeemables. There is nothing an orc can do that is ever good. Orcs began 
thousands of years ago as elves that have been corrupted by Morgoth and then by Sauron. But they've been so corrupted that now there's nothing left in them that is good. Which is why you can, you know, you can do like in the movie and just kill orcs willy-nilly. There is no genocide against orcs. It's just orc hunting season. You, the more orcs you can kill, the more scalped you can get, go for it. Okay? There's no wrong associated with killing orcs for any reason. You walk up, there's an orc calmly sitting there drinking water out of a river. <coughs> you know, just whatever you want. He is as bad as an orc and deserves death. Gandalf deserves it. Okay, deserves death. He has earned death. He has merited death. How? By his actions, Frodo is saying. What position is Frodo putting himself in? Okay, what else? And prosecutor. Prosecutor, judge, jury. You know, and if you give me the button for the electric chair, I'll fry you, sorry, little. Gandalf says, deserves it? I dare say he does. In other words, I don't, I don't disagree with you, Frodo, you're right. Gollum probably does deserve to die. Many that live deserve death. Woo! He's just expanded from Gollum to, there's an awful lot of people that are sucking air who shouldn't be. And then he flips it. And some that die deserve life. Can you give it to them? What does he mean, some die that deserve life? Good people pass. Every weekend in Chicago. Get on the Drudge Report Monday morning. Every freaking weekend. There's somewhere between 7 and 10 homicides. And about 100 shootings. Usually they're not gangbangers. Usually they're innocent, you know, kids sitting at home watching TV. Stray bullet from the street. Many that live deserve life. Some that live deserve life. Can you give it to them? Gandalf's not talking about, about that innocent kid in his living room watching TV. He's talking about people that are condemned wrongly. Can you bring them back? Notice, can you give it to them? Can you bring back the dead, Frodo? What's he saying? What if you're wrong about Paul? What if he's not just an enemy? Then do not be too eager to deal out death in judgment. Notice he doesn't say, do not deal out death in judgment. He says, don't be too eager. Eager. What does the too eager mean? Don't be so quick to judge. Don't just jump to conclusions. Okay? But I think Tolkien probably was saying, don't kill in judgment. Lock him up. And he's going to give us a, a rationale why in a moment. Do not be too eager to deal out death and judgment. For even the very wise cannot see all ends. What does he mean? What does he mean by that word ends? He has two meanings in mind. One is the ordinary one that you assume, which is the end of things. One cannot see the end of the story, so to speak. Okay, that's one meaning of it. What's the other meaning of it? Yeah, it almost goes to the beginning of that. Purposes. He says, even the very wise can't see how all things are going to play out. Nor can we see what are the purposes of all things. What about in our world? Do you know how you're going to die? Unless you're contemplating suicide and you're going to do it soon. Probably not. Okay? Do you know where you were born? 
Definitely not. Other than that, your parents got together one night. For whatever reason. Maybe it was an accident. Maybe it wasn't. Okay? But you don't even know then what they, what was in, well, you have a little idea of what there was in their mind, but they might have had a little bit more too. Are they planning on you becoming somebody who's going to solve the problem of cancer? No idea. But that's what he's getting at. We don't know what, why a being exists. We don't know their purpose for being. And I don't know how golems and will come about and what it will mean and what it will involve. <coughs> so he says, I have not much hope that Gollum can be cured before he dies, but there is a chance of it. I have not much hope that Gollum can be cured before he dies. What does that mean? I don't have much hope, but he does have some the more important question is, why does he care? Why does he care that Gollum, what, be cured before he dies? Louder? To redeem him. But there is a chance of it. What's another word for cure? Okay, you know you can buy cured meat, right? It's preserved, okay? What do you do with cured meat? There's a yeah. verb before you cook it because you usually have it a long time. So you are what in the meat for maybe a special occasion? Yeah. Saving it. You're saving it. Okay? You're saving it. When Gandalf says, I have not much hope that Gollum can be cured, he means by cured, both cured in its kind of medical sense, which means what? Healed of whatever is wrong with him. What's wrong with Gollum? Let me count the way. You know? <laughs> A whole bunch of things. Okay? And what else? If he can be cured, made well, what is that really? That's being saved. Not a, you know, pray to Jesus saved, but it is a redeemed idea. Because in Christianity generally, all the branches generally, one of the things, one of the characteristics of all humankind after Adam and Eve is we're all sick. We're all sick. Some branches of Christianity call it sin. Others call it sickness, illness. So we're all sick. We all need what then? A cure. Gandalf is saying the same thing. Gollum is sick. He needs a cure. He's saying... I hope he can be cured before he dies. Why before he dies? Well, he can't be cured afterwards because you're already dead. You know, not like cryogenics. I'm going to bring you back and make you well. And, you know. But I think it's because for Gandalf, he's suggesting something about Gollum after death. We're going to see that towards the end of the novel because Gollum and Frodo are going to interact again just before the ring is destroyed, and Frodo's going to say some things to him. And then after the ring is destroyed, Frodo is going to tell Sam, we must forgive him. Okay. Why? Because the quest wouldn't have been achieved had it not been for God. Well, go back and reread what Christ says in the Gospels about forgiving others. Especially forgiving others for their sins held against you. And what that does to that individual. If you forgive others their sins, their sins are forgiven. And judge not lest you be judged, for you're going to be judged by the same judgment with which you judge others. Think of the Lord's Prayer, okay, which involves that. Forgive us our debts as 
we forgive those who trespass against us. What's, what's that prayer saying? God, forgive me exactly the way I forgive those who do wrong against me. That's a pretty, pretty, uh, what do you want to call that? Narrow tightrope? Because what does that mean? If I don't forget somebody, forgive somebody else for something they've done to me, God kind of goes, okay, <laughs> you're screwed. Yeah, exactly. I'm not going to forgive you then when you don't do that. Okay? So Tolkien brings up this idea, not of, again, not Gollum's going to heaven, but this idea of redemption here. Remember what I said? I think I said it last week. Maybe I didn't. He says it in one of his letters. The Lord of the Rings is fundamentally, he says in one of his letters, a religious and philosophical work, more so in the revising than in the creation. What does he mean? As he revised, there's at least 10 drafts of the Lord of the Rings, more of some sections. As he revised, as he got older, okay, he began writing this, portions of this, shortly before publication of The Hobbit in 1937. It's published in 1954. He's working on this sucker for 17 years. All right? So there's a lot of revising going on. As he's revising, his religious and philosophical ideas find their way in, and he leaves them in. I think this is one of them, that Gandalf wants Gollum to be whole. We're going to see Gandalf has this mentality towards almost everybody. I'd say probably the only one he doesn't really is Sauron. But we're going to see through interactions he'll have later on, he gives Saruman time and time and time again opportunities to do what? Yeah. To repent. To turn from your wicked ways, he says, and prove yourself a help. In other words, he gives him a second chance and a third chance fourth chance and a fifth chance and Saruman never takes the bait he never bites okay and he ends up suffering as a result of it. so Gandalf goes on not only that he can be cured before his end and he is bound up with the fate of the ring my heart tells me that he has some part to play yet for good or ill before the end and when that comes the pity of Bobo may rule the fate of many yours not least okay and it does we find out. So, they keep talking. And Frodo says, well, we need to destroy the ring. How, how do you do that? Page 61, Gandalf says, and we're going to move along pretty quickly after this. Gandalf says, well, there's only one way. you got to go to Mount Doom, and you got to find the cracks of Doom, and cast the ring in there. If you ever, if you really wish to destroy it. So you got to march into Sauron's backyard, and you got to go way down deep into his territory. Go to the mountain, find the Cracks of Doom. First of all, it's not like there's a sign, Cracks of Doom, three quarters of a mile. Okay? You got to go there, you got to find it, and you have to throw the ring. You don't have to say special spell or words, you know, it's just throw it in. Frodo, I do really wish to destroy it. Notice what he's just said. Notice the agency. Who's doing the action? I. I do really wish to destroy it. And then he catches himself. Or, well, to have it destroyed. First sentence is completely active voice. Second sentence is entirely passive voice. I wish to have the ring destroyed. I don't really want to be the one doing the destroying. That's like saying, you know, I do really wish to mow my lawn. Oh, actually, I wish my lawn were mowed. <laughs> that is, somebody else get out there when it's 110 degrees and mow that sucker. I am not made for perilous quests. I wish I had never seen the ring. Why did it come to me? Why was I chosen? Why me? Gandalf. <laughs> and notice what he says. This is, you know, my little tie-in with the war and terror. George Bush, I think, probably asked that very same question of himself just moments 
after Andy Card spoke into his ear as he was reading my pet goat and said, uh, Mr. President, the United States is under attack. The World Trade Centers have been flown into. Bush probably first thought, shit. And he probably second thought, why me? Why didn't this happen under Clinton's watch? I mean, nine months. It's only nine months. Why didn't they do it nine months ago? Because his whole presidency was supposed to be about what? All domestic stuff. Taxes, welfare reform, social security reform, education reform, all. He said, I'm not going to go do nation building. And what happens? He becomes the nation builder, you know, par excellence with Afghanistan and Iraq and stuff. Okay? Gandalf. Such questions cannot be answered. Next. Shut up. Next. If you're going to ask a question, ask a good question. That's not a good question. So he says, you may be sure it was not for any merit that others do not possess. Frodo, you weren't given the ring because of some great power you possess. It's not because the gods said, oh, let's give it to Frodo because he's so humble. No. Not for power or wisdom at any rate. Because if it were going to be debated upon, dependent upon power or wisdom, who would the ring go to? Well, Gandalf, you know, because he's got both in spades. Aragorn, maybe not as much power or wisdom. Um, Elrond, Galadriel, Tom Bombadil, we're going to see in a few moments, who I think runs circles around all those other guys in terms of power and wisdom. Okay, we'll talk about why. But you've been chosen, and you must therefore use such strength and heart and wits as you have. Okay. Who is Frodo Baggins again? Three-foot midget. Three-foot midget. Okay. You must use what strength? Okay, now this might mean physical, muscular strength. You gotta use all the strength you have, Frodo. Woo, that's not much. Okay. So what else does it mean? Fortitude, courage, you know, intestinal strength. He might have a little bit of that. And heart, that's definitely courage. And wits, we're going to see how smart he is, because that's what Tolkien means by wits. But I have so little of any of these things. Ah, Frodo friendly shows us a little humility which is important. You are wise and powerful. Will you not take the ring? What is that? That's the ring going, take me home. If, if I come into your hands, you will immediately vie for a supremacy against Sauron. Which there's always the possibility Gandalf will defeat Sauron. But the ring doesn't care. It just wants to be in the hands of the most powerful. Gandalf, no, springing to his feet, jumping away. Why? Why doesn't he want the ring? It'll corrupt him. Lord Acton said, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Okay. Now, when the book came out, a lot of people said, oh, I know what the ring is. The ring is an atomic bomb. Nuclear warfare. Right. Let's say it is. Gandalf says, no. With that power, I should have power too great. Put the ring situation in the real world. And this is fat little crazy guy in North Korea. And somebody offers him the ring. You think he'd take it? Kim Jong-un just detonated, according to the Norks, a hydrogen bomb which is, you know, like taking atom bombs, another whole order of level higher. His previous most powerful bomb was 10 kiloton. They're estimating the one he detonated the other day is 70 to 120 kilotons. So 7 to 12 times more powerful. The Chinese are actually saying the mountain he detonated in is in danger of collapsing and releasing all the radiation. Okay? It's nothing compared to ours. I mean, if you're going to have a, so to speak, pissing contest, we've got 
megaton hydrogen bombs, not kiloton, megaton thousands of tons, as opposed to, excuse me, hundreds of thousands of tons of TNT, as opposed to just thousands of tons, okay? So, yeah, he'd take it in a heartbeat. Hitler was, was working on them when they gave up, because they couldn't get it. Why? Because all the smart guys came to the United States, Einstein and, you know, all of them. So Gandalf says, I dare not take it even to keep it safe. The wish to wield it would be too great for my strength. Notice what he's saying there. If I have the ring, what's going to happen? I will use it. I will use it. What will he use it for? To annihilate everybody and become Gandalf the Great? No. He's going to attempt to use it for good. What's the problem with that? As Gandalf will tell us later in the Council of Elrond. Because the ring is inherently evil. See, the, some of you are going to disagree with me on this. The ring is not like a gun, a weapon. A gun, whichever kind of gun you choose, whether you're talking a BB gun or a howitzer or a rail gun or, you know, in and of itself, is it inherently evil? Do you get evil by touching the handle of a revolver? Does it rub off on you? No, it doesn't. Does the gun do, quote unquote, evil by just sitting there? No, it doesn't. The ring does. The ring, maybe the good analogy to use for the ring is the ring, let's say, is made of, you know, polonium 112. You just get it's a nuclear. Radioactive element. You get close enough to it and you get sick. It's what the Russians like to use to assassinate people. A little, little dose of polonium 112 shot in the neck and you develop radiation poisoning and you die a very, very painful death. Okay? One of the years I was teaching in London, there was a guy who had fled Putin's Russia who suddenly came down with polonium poisoning and found out he had been poked in the side by an umbrella leaving a restaurant. Very James Bond-esque, okay? And it was polonium injected because they found the injection point and all that kind of stuff. And he died about three weeks later. If you're curious, his name was, I think it says, Litovinko, okay? He used to be a real nice looking guy. By the time he was nearly dead, all his hair was gone, his face was all wasted away and all this kind of stuff. Okay. The ring is kind of like that. You just get close enough to it and it's evil rubs off on you. Okay? So Gandalf says no. Why? It will try to use me to use it to do good. No good can ever come from the ring. So they realize, Gandalf does, Sam is listening into the conversation and he pulls him in says, what have you heard? He says, oh, a little bit about dragons and elves, and, you know. So Gandalf says to Sam, your punishment for eavesdropping is you're going to go to, with Mr. Frodo. Well, where is he going? He's, he's going to go to Rivendell. Me, see elves and all, woo -hoo. What does Sam think? I'm going to Disney. This is the greatest vacation you could have. I get to actually go see elves. He loves when Mr. Bilbo used to tell him stories of elves. Now he's going to go see them. In fact, he doesn't even have to get to Rivendell to see elves, does he? They're not even out of the Shire when they see Gildor and all these other elves. Okay. Sam could die fat, dumb, and happy right there because he's seen elves. Like me, wanting to see you know, aliens or whatever. But he's not going to go see elves. He's going to live with elves. He's going to talk with elves. He's going to travel with an elf. Okay. He's going to have be so full of elves... That at the end of the book, when he finally comes down and his wife sits him down in his barker lounger, he's going to go, you know, I don't care if I ever see another damn elf in my life. <laughs> or go anywhere. I just want to sit here and, you know, be happy. Okay? So, next chapter is Three is Company, where we're going to skip a bunch. And the shortcut to mushrooms. So, Three is Company, Frodo, Sam, Pippin, 
leave Bag Inn to move to Crick Hollow. Frodo wants to be away from the Shire, away from Hobbiton, because now that Bilbo's gone, it just doesn't have as much for him anymore. And he wants to live out his life, you know, in the country. Like, you know, like, like Hobbiton isn't in the country. I mean, how many people are in Hobbiton? A couple of hundred at most? It's not like a bustling metropolis, right? So they go there, and the conspiracy is unmasked. They say, we're coming with you, Frodo. We know what you're carrying. So they decide to go to Bree. Mary says, I know a shortcut. What happens on the shortcut? They get captured by Old Man Willow. Right? Who's they, first of all? Pippin and Mary. Sam and Frodo. No? Fred, Sam and Frodo can go, man, it sucks to be you, and leave. You know? But they don't. They kind of run around and say, help, help, help. Where are they? They're in the middle of the forest. Who are they yelling help to? Right? But help comes. This crazy, wrinkled old guy comes singing these veggie tales, silly songs, as he runs <laughs> through the area. And he sings to Old Man Willow, and Old Man Willow opens him up, up, and he takes them to his house. And we hear his name, Tom Bombadil. We are going to have to take a break a minute because I'm going to have to refill my water bottle. So, page 131. They're in Tom's house. He's got a fire going. Tom's talking to them, telling them stories. And time just kind of passes in and out. Or they pass in and out of time. They hear Tom talking about the time before the old forest, about his interactions with Old Man Willow, and we hear at the top of 131, when they caught his words again, they found that he had now wandered into strange regions beyond their memory, beyond their waking thought, into times when the world was wider and the seas flowed straight to the western shore. And still on and back, Tom went singing out into ancient starlight, when only the elf sires were awake. Then suddenly he stopped, and they saw that he nodded as if he was falling asleep. They sat still before him, enchanted. If you read that essay by Tolkien, this is what he's talking about, kind of by fairy and drama. Tom Bombadil is talking, and they are totally in the story he's telling them. It's as if it is real to them. And it seemed as if under the spell of his words, okay, spell, the meaning of it, means both a word spoken, like my just saying, a word spoken, that's a spell, as well as a word of power, abracadabra, you know, open sesame, or melon, as we will see later on in here. As if under the spell of his words, the wind had gone, the clouds had dried up, and the day had been withdrawn, and darkness had come from east and west, and all the sky was filled with the light of white stars. Whether the morning and evening of one day or many days had passed, Frodo could not tell. He's not hungry. He's not tired. He's just filled with wonder. He's experiencing what we were talking about last week. Recovery. He is seeing through this enchantment everything like it's just been created. And Frodo says, Who are you, Master? Tom could, you know, walk up to him, smack him upside the head and say, What do you mean? I told you, I'm Tom Bombadil. But what does Tom say? Eh? What? Says Tom, sitting up, his eyes glinting in the gloom. Don't you know my name yet? What the hell does that mean? Uh, Tom Bombadil? Tom seems to be implying, based upon everything I've told you, all these stories, you ought to be developing an idea of who I am. Great storyteller. That's the only answer. Tell me, who are you? Alone, yourself, nameless. Who are you, Frodo Baggins? Alone, that is without anybody else, without a Frodo, uh, Bilbo Baggins, without a Drogo and whatever his wife's name was, Baggins. 
yourself, and nameless. Wait, wait, wait. Everybody has a name. Because where do you get your name from? Your parents. I mean, they name you. So how are you nameless? When can you be nameless? When you develop amnesia? <laughs> it's not what he's talking about. But you are young and I am old. Eldest, that's what I am. What does eldest mean? Does it mean really, 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 really old? Nope. The est part is the all important ending. In adjectives, you have the positive form, the comparative form, the superlative form. Old, older, oldest, or eld, elder, eldest. The ist means you don't get any elder than that. You don't get any eldest beyond. It's the oldest there possibly is. So he says, that's what I am. So is he saying, I'm the oldest living thing? Yes, that's exactly what he's saying. Okay, Is it just the oldest living thing? That word, that's where I'm not so sure. What does he say? Mark my words, my friends. In other words, pay attention now. This is going to be really important, and it will show up on the quiz. Tom was here before the river and the trees. Well, okay, rivers form and go away over thousands of years. We've already talked about Galadriel is over a couple thousand years old. Elrond is. Gandalf is. Okay, so, so he's really old. And before the trees, trees, you know, a couple hundred thousand years maybe old. Okay. Tom remembers the first raindrop and the first acorn. Okay, now that's a little different. First raindrop. So he's older than weather. Okay, now that's pretty damn old. How, how do you be older than weather? He made paths before the big people and saw the little people arriving. Who are the big people and who are the little people? Big people are elves and men. Little people are hobbits and dwarves. Elves are awakened first, then men, then dwarves, and then hobbits sometime after that. We don't really know when. Okay? He was here before the kings and the graves and the Barrowites which you talked about a little bit. We're going to hear more about them later. When the elves passed westward, Tom was here already, before the seas were bent. What in the world is he talking about? Well, in Tolkien's cosmology, in the Silmarillion, at the beginning, the creation of the world, the world is flat. And over here, in what is called the Utter West, you have the island of, that's an A, of Valinor, and over here you have Middle Earth. And this is a sea that separates there. Okay? So you can get from Middle Earth to Valinor by getting in a boat and rowing across the ocean. Valinor is where the gods dwell. The Valar that I mentioned, okay? So Tom says, I was here when the elves passed westward. The elves, when they wake up from their creation, they wake up here. One of the gods from over here comes over here and says, we want you guys to come live with us so that we can teach you stuff because we're really smart. And so the elves go across. Tom says, I was here before they went across. This is like two or three days after the awakening of the elves. Before the seas were bent. See, the seas get bent because the elves come over here. All hell breaks loose, kind of literally, because of the elves. And the gods say, okay, we've got to change the world because we don't want you riffraff coming over here anymore. So they get this. And they make it like that. There's another island, by the way, out here called, I can't spell it with my left hand, Westernessa, okay? Or Numenor, as it's also called. He says, I was here already before the seas were bent. He's going back in time. 
And then he goes even farther back. He, Tom, knew the dark under the stars when it was fearless, before the dark lord came from outside. Now, who's the dark lord? Sauron? That is who is usually called the dark lord in the Lord of the Rings. I don't think he's talking about Sauron. I think he's talking about Sauron's master. Okay. Who is a guy named Avalar, or Avala, named Melkor, a.k.a. Morgoth. Okay. He was the one who blew the kazoo during the symphony back in the presence of Eruel Uvatar. Okay? So Eruel Uvatar shows them the film of the world, and he shows them the elves and men. Okay? And Melkor comes up with the idea, I'm going to go screw up his creation. I'm going to go mess around with his elves and men. Why? Because he can't strike back at God, so he's going to kick his pets. So what it amounts to? I can't hurt you, so I'm going to strangle your cat. Okay? So when Tom says, I was here before the Dark Lord came from the outside, I think he's saying, I, Tom Bombadil, TB, was here when Melkor left the presence of Aru Iluvatar and came into what is called this place, Arda. The only problem is, is according to the Anulandale, which is the song of creation in Silverill, according to that, there isn't anybody here before Melkor comes. Nobody. Nothing. Melkor comes, then the other gods come. Because they want to stop him from screwing up. Tom says, I was already here. Okay, so what does that mean? Tolkien forgot. Not likely with Tolkien. He's just very, very anal about things like that. Okay? So what does it mean? Who are you, Master? Tom says. Uh, Frodo asks. Eldest. Who are you, yourself, alone? Nameless. Okay? So who can be said to be alone, yourself, nameless? What does it mean to be nameless? As, I, as we said, you get named by whom? No one created you. Your parents. No one created you. You are self-existing, or as Orthodox say, eternally existent. What did Moses hear? When God spoke to him out of the fiery bush, when he said, okay, okay, you want me to go down to Pharaoh, you want me to tell Pharaoh and let everybody go, who am I supposed to say sent me? In other words, give me your calling card, God. I can't just go and say it's me. What does God say? I am who I am. I am. The I am is the one, what does that mean? I am. I exist. None of us can really say that. I mean, yes, we can say we exist. But we can't say I exist on my own. I don't. My parents brought me into being. See, each of us is completely dependent. We D, which means out of or from, pendant. We hang from something or somebody else. Family tree. You hang from your parents. They hang from their parents. They hang from their parents. You go all the way back and we're all related, right? Okay? So, Iru Lubitar is the only one, or God is the only one that is independent. Not hanging from anybody else. Self-hanging, in other words. I think Tom Bombadil is a manifestation of Iru Iluvatar. I don't have any proof. All Tolkien ever says about him in his letters is he says, one, he's a spirit of pacifism because he doesn't take up arms against anybody. 
Not even old man Will. You would think after old man Will tries to eat your friend, you go at that sucker with an axe or a blowtorch. You just take him out. No, Tom's going to sit there and go down by the withy window and sing to him, you know. Barrel whites, okay, he exposes them to the light. Maybe that's for their cure. I don't know, okay. Tom doesn't carry a weapon unless you carry, consider his song to be his weapon. How does Uru Luvatar create everything? Through song, okay. So he keeps talking and such, and we're going to take a, a real quick break in just a minute. And Tom says, show me the ring, Frodo. Frodo pulls the ring out of his pocket and hands it to him without any hesitation. He doesn't go, mm, no, <laughs> it's mine, it's my precious. No. None of that. He just hands it right over to him. And he's surprised as he does it, we're told. Bottom of 132. To his own astonishment, he drew out the chain from his pocket, unfastening the ring, handed it once to Tom. What does Tom Bombadil do? Sits there, lays in his hand, and he puts it on his finger. And they all look at him as he's wearing it on his finger. What's wrong? He's not invisible. And Frodo's like, oh no, it no longer works. Tom laughs. And he spins the ring in the air, and it disappears. And Frodo cries. And then Tom hands it back to him. And Frodo's like, better, bring, better make sure it's the same ring. He goes back and sits in his thing, and puts it on his finger, and walks out. And Tom says, come on, Frodo. I'm not so blind as that. All the others don't see Frodo, but Tom does. OK, so in Tom's house, or maybe in his little kingdom, if you want, whatever the total boundaries are, what effect does either the ring have on him or he has on the ring? The ring has no effect on him, right? And he seems to have an effect on the ring. He can stop the ring from making things invisible. He can see when the ring makes somebody else invisible. In other words, we're going to hear this language about people existing in kind of two places. The, the world that we see in a world that we don't see. Tom seemingly exists in both simultaneously. In both the seen and the unseen world. So that when Frodo gets up and starts to walk away, it's like, stop that. Go sit down. <laughs> okay? I think that's another reason to think maybe Tom's a manifestation of Eru Iluvatar. Because when Eru, if he is, in, in Uru Luvatar, you know, has this epiphany down here. Epiphany means a manifestation of God. Has this epiphany down here. Does that mean he's no longer up wherever out there in heaven land? No. You know, what, what's one of the kind of classical definitions of God? Omniscient, right? All-knowing. Omnipotent, all-power. What's the third omni? Omnipresent. Everywhere. The Orthodox Church, we say he fillest all things. Yep. Even this bottle cap. <laughs> even this phone. Even this book. Even this shirt. Even this ugly plastic in this god awful building. Okay. So they leave Tom Bombadil's, and we're going to take a real quick break. And we go to Fog on the Barrow Downs. And I'm going to stop this. And we're going to come back in like no more than five minutes. <laughs>